Today, I think, is a really appropriate day to be talking about picoRNA viruses because rhinoviruses are some of the major picoRNA viruses, and this is perfect weather for rhinoviruses, um, major common cold viruses. So we'll um, talk about those. But first, there were a couple of things I wanted to mention on the midterm, and these are questions that Let's see, more than 50 people missed out of the 60-some who took the exam, which probably means they're really bad questions. Um, and the high score, by the way, hopefully it was clear, was 44, but the next highest was 38. And so whoever that 44 was, they're obviously a ringer, and um, they will probably not be included in the curve at the end. So um, but I'm only going to curve at the final, um, final point. So the um, main reason to study viruses, as proposed by Salvador Luria, was simplicity because viruses are these really wonderful model systems to understand basically everything. And so the big message there was the simplicity. Um, that wasn't as critical. I think this is actually a much more important question, and that is what's the value of the PFU per infected cell in the latent phase of a one-step growth curve? And the answer is one. And here's just an example of many of those one-step growth curves. Why is there one PFU per cell here? So all of the cells are infected. And how do you get PFUs? Now, so what's the process? Where does the plaque come from, the plaque-forming unit? So it's yes, lysine, so the, but it's, you have to do a plaque assay. And the way you do a plaque assay is you take a sample from here and you mix it together with your massed excess of host cells and then you do a plaque assay. Each of the infected cells will produce a plaque. So if you've got all of your infected cells here, each of those cells is going to be producing a plaque. You don't have any, anything that goes beyond this is then actual extra virus production. So is that clear to people? It wasn't to something like 56 of you. So um, I guess I didn't do a good job of, of explaining that. But yeah, so the real point here is that, you know, these are, at least for this black line, which is your infectious virus, this is a plaque assay. And it's a, this is a much longer afterwards. You see here it takes about 30 hours to get through that whole replication cycle. So if you're actually doing a plaque assay, it's probably going to take you a week, or at least you know, three, or, three or four days to actually get those multiple rounds of infection that you have to get in order to be able to see a plaque. Okay, hopefully that's a little clearer now. Um, this one I probably skipped over far too quickly when we went through the structural aspect of things, we're going to be talking a lot about enveloped viruses through the rest of the course, and that's why I wanted to revisit this one as well. Virus envelope proteins, and this is just the figure from the textbook, the old textbook, but the one I used in lecture, uh, generally have sugar molecules covalently attached. That's glycosylated. So almost all of these are glycosylated. That's what all of these blue Ys are up on top here of your virus envelope proteins. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is so that they're not too sticky, and so individual virus particles don't end up, Siberians don't end up sticking to each other. The other one is often trying to avoid host immunity, and this is particularly true for a lot of the enveloped animal viruses. So it's a way to cloak yourself from the cellular immunity processes. Lipid molecules covalently attached, this is true for very few viruses. HIV is a nice exception to that, where there are, in fact, lipid molecules attached to these virus envelope proteins. Immunoglobulin folds are present where? In the receptors, the virus receptor binding proteins, exactly. Multiple transmembrane domains, how many do we have here? One. Uh, and this gets back to smaller is better. So if you have multiple transmembrane domains, you're going to be spending a lot more of your virus genome encoding these extra bits that you don't really need. Now, usually the whole multiple transmembrane helices, that's if you're making a core, you've got a transporter, something like that. 
And so here, you just need to be sticking them in the membrane. So stick them in the membrane, one transmembrane helix is more than enough. That being said, and again, the whole idea of smaller is better, at least in terms of your genome, if you can use multiple copies of one thing, it's definitely much better to do that than have just a single copy. And this is true for almost all of the envelope proteins. Actually, I don't know any envelope proteins that are present as and functional as monomers. They're almost always trimers, as we talked about, for influenza hemagglutinin, or dimers in a couple of cases we'll talk about later for the flaviviruses. So um, again, this is more for things that are coming on a little bit later on. And then for stuff that we hopefully talked about, I was actually kind of surprised that there was confusion on this one. Uh, regulation of gene expression in bacteria of HT7 infected cells is due to transcriptional activators, repression, antitermination, initiation, or translational activation. Uh, it's all about where you start and where your transcription starts in terms of which genes are being made. And so it's all about transcriptional initiation. There are no activators per se in this system. It's all the T7 RNA polymerase and how well it binds to the promoter. So there's no particular activation or repression. Any termination is really important for that other virus, lambda. Um, initiation again here. Translational activation, I don't know very many systems where we've got translational activation, stimulation. We'll talk about some cases today with the picoRNA viruses where different translational initiation, but not activation per se. So there are questions about the exam before we, before we move on. Yeah? If there's a discrepancy between the storage that I got from the Raven virus 3 versus the storage that you reported, what is it? What should we do about that? You should make sure that the Scantron works, which I'm going to be giving back to you after class. And if there's something misgraded on there, please. And just check that, please, today before you run off and then erase everything and fill in the correct answers. And I scan things, so. <laughs> um, other questions, comments, worries? Um, I did give everyone an extra point for the one that I messed up because I thought I was clarifying the question and end up meeting it completely wrong. So that's what happens when I go back and edit my exams. It's a bad idea. <laughs> um, there were two correct answers. That was the problem. So it could, have been, it could have been the positive strand or the negative strand. And so, I, the, so back up a little bit how the Stedman writes his exams. He'll get inside his brain. <laughs> uh, is, you know, what's the plus stand for when you're talking about single-stranded you know, RNA viruses? And I said, well, plus versus the minus. You know, so what, to try and clarify what that plus meant. And so I added the minus, and of course that then meant oh, it could have been the coding strand or the non-coding strand. So that was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> mea maxima culpa, mea maxima culpa, mea maxima culpa, yeah. So, sorry about that. So, again, I, I, this was, that was a very, it was as usual, the last minute thing, change that I made in the exam because I was trying to make it easier and more clear. Obviously, completely wrong. So, see, I probably will only get about 50% on most of my exams if I, you know. Didn't think about it. So, <clears throat> again, wonderful weather for picoRNA viruses, <clears throat> um, particularly the rhinoviruses. And this is a nice example of some rhinovirus virions um, right here. As usual, sort of you know, standard process, the way we're going to be going through this, talk about where they came from, a little bit about structure, binding, entry, and genome. But really important for these picoRNA viruses is replication and translation because we haven't really talked about how you replicate RNA viruses with the exception of the small RNA phage. And translation, it turns out, for these picoRNA viruses is really important and different than anything we've talked about so far. Release is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Where do these viruses come from? Finally, we're talking about viruses that are causing disease. Uh, probably the best known of these diseases is polio, poliomyelitis. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons we know so much about these picoRNA viruses has to do with poliomyelitis and the large amounts of investment that's been made in trying to hopefully eventually eradicate um, polio. And we'll 
if we got some time at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but that being said, it's by no means the most common of these picoRNA viruses. The most common are these human rhinoviruses, rhino being nose. So basically, 50% of common colds are due to rhinovirus infection. And I probably have a rhinovirus infection right now, um, thanks to my little virus vectors running around and spreading viruses um, here, there, and everywhere. Uh, so those are sort of the, the two main ones here. And human rhinovirus, when I say rhinovirus, it's really rhinoviruses. There are absolutely ridiculous number of these kinds of viruses. And we'll talk a little bit about them at the end, but because they're so different relative to each other, it's hard to make generalizations. The last one I wanted to talk about just briefly here is hepatitis A, uh, which is <clears throat> basically showing that you can get very different kinds of pathogenesis from basically the same kind of virus. Poliomyelitis, um, mostly, in fact, is a gastrointestinal um, virus, but very occasionally it gets into the nervous system, and that's where you have problems. Um, rhinoviruses, again, almost always an upper respiratory fact, and hepatitis A virus is uh, hepatitis of liver disease. So very similar molecularly, extremely different kinds of pathologies, and there are probably way more than just four additional um, genera of picoRNA viruses, um, probably way, way, way more. Um, you'll probably notice that I'm seeing picoRNA viruses rather than picornaviruses. I have no idea where people came up with this picornavirus thing. These are small RNA viruses, picoRNA viruses. Why you need to come up with something that sounds cooler, no idea. And I think it's actually easier to remember if you say picoRNA virus as opposed to picornavirus. But be that as it may, a lot of the literature, a lot of times you're talking to somebody who's working in this field, they'll call them picornaviruses. Don't ask me why. So why do a lot of people study polio? Um, that's because it's a disease which has been around for a very long time. This is about a 5,000-year-old <clears throat> Egyptian representation of somebody who probably had polio. I know we don't have virus from this person, but <clears throat> it's a very clear phenotype. It's something that you see really uh, often in, fortunately, what's getting to be fewer and fewer of these cases um, worldwide. And the reason for that is we've got really good vaccines, again, mostly having to do with a lot of investment into this disease. Unfortunately, mostly um, affects children and adolescents. Um, and was even a huge problem in the U.S. And I don't know how many of you have been in Portland long enough to know the ex-director of the Portland Symphony, or I say the Oregon Symphony Orchestra, who also had polio uh, a couple of years back um, when he retired. Uh, two different vaccines. There's an inactivated vaccine and an attenuated vaccine. And we may have some time to talk about these a little bit later on. But because of these really good vaccines, um, we have now been able to get polio really restricted. And uh, this is an image from a couple of years ago. Um, this is polioeradication.org. If we've got a chance, we'll get back to it a little bit later on. Yeah? Uh, what is the difference between an inactivated and an attenuated vaccine? Okay, we'll talk more about vaccines later. So the question is, what's the difference between an inactivated and an attenuated? So inactivated is a killed virus or killed virion, basically broken apart in some way, either formaldehyde or um, I think sometimes people use heat denaturation detergents. Pretty sure that the salt vaccine, if we back up here, <clears throat> is a formaldehyde treated. Um, whereas the attenuated vaccine, um, these are vaccines which have been replicated in some organism, usually an animal, you know, non-human host, for multiple passages. So you purify virus, you infect purify virus, infect, purify virus, infect. And so over long periods of time, usually tens to, in some cases, even hundreds of these infection cycles, what people call passages, then you end up with something which still gives a nice immune response, but is not giving much pathogenesis. And if you think about it, each of the viruses you isolate each time, you're going to keep isolating the ones that are giving you less and less pathogenesis. And so the idea there is you get a nice immune response. These viruses replicate which is one of the big advantage of them. You can use much lower doses 
of these vaccines because they will make more of those individual viruses and still be at a level where they're not causing disease, although there's some issues with using live versus inactivated. Um, but this is the one that's mostly being used, in fact, in cases like this to try and get rid of the disease because one of the big advantages, again, this is an enterovirus, so usually goes to the digestive tract. It's still replicating in whatever has come out at the other end of the digestive tract. And so people who are in areas of the world where sanitation is not the greatest actually get immunized because of the fact that other people have been immunized. So it's a quite nice advantage as far as that's concerned. Um, and <clears throat> speaking of that, as of 2010, so a little over four years ago now, these are the places where people were reporting poliovirus infections, and these are the various different wild viruses. In just two years, this had gone down to here. Um, we were basically talking about six or seven countries. And then just uh, the update for the 15th of April of this year, uh, there are a couple of changes that have happened there. Um, the big one is that no longer endemic in India, which is really pretty amazing public health, uh, I don't know, miracle maybe a little far, but uh, yeah, just an amazing accomplishment, really, really an amazing accomplishment. Uh, there are, unfortunately, still a number of places where there are wild polio being found, and unfortunately, these are in parts of the world, like here, right between Pakistan and Afghanistan, where it's really hard to get to. Um, there are lots of political issues there. Also, Syria and Iraq, clear political issues. Right here next to Somalia, clear political issues. So um, actually, being able to finally eliminate polio is going to be very challenging. Very recently, um, there's a current outbreak going on in Gambia. Some of you may have heard about this. So it's uh, this country in equatorial Africa, right next to Cameroon, which probably got their um, virus from Nigeria. Nigeria has been one of the harder nuts, as it were, to crack in terms of getting polio vaccination. Um, again, we can talk more about this later. A lot of this has to do with some um, religious um, issues um, with, with Nigeria. And certainly um, also true in, in Pakistan is that the vaccinators are thought to be not um, appropriate, maybe is the right word for that. But um, we can talk more about this. We've got some more time at the end of class as well. So, um, but really, it's the vaccines which have made this possible. Those vaccines were developed in the 50s. So um, it's taken a while to get to this point. Um, and unfortunately, we've actually gone up in terms of numbers of countries um, from here to here. But at least, again, India is now polio-free. What does the virus look like? Or what did you say? What does the virion look like? We've basically looked at this already before. Pseudo T equals 3, <coughs> icosahedral symmetry. Pseudo means what? Multiple different capsid proteins, exactly. VP1, VP2, and VP3. There are 60 each of them. Um, there's a VP4, which is an internal protein, also 60 copies of those. So if you look at the virions, here's an example here of the cryo at the top, and we have X-ray crystallographic structures for these viruses as well. That's down here at the bottom. Five-fold axis. Down here, where you've got five of your VP proteins associated with each other. Here's a six-fold axis, um, and then the five-fold axis. So one and one, giving you a pseudo T equals three. What's interesting about the poliovirus in particular is you don't see any kind of projections coming out particularly, a little bit at the five-fold axis of symmetry, but these are really pretty flat particles. And so the question immediately comes up is how are these guys interacting with their receptors? And it turns out that for the polio virus, the receptor is actually in an indentation in this capsid structure as opposed to something which is projecting on the outside. So it's really quite <coughs> unusual. It's a little bit easier to look at the structure in the form that we looked at when we talked about structure way back before. Um, here again is that crystal structure right here. The individual icosahedral faces in the middle here are made up again of VP2, VP3, and VP1. Um, each of them different colors here, blue, red, and yellow. Um, they come together 
and form these icosahedral faces. Each of them has a very similar structure, so VP1 is a similar structure to VP2 and a similar structure to VP3. The difference are in these gray loops that you can see down here at the bottom. But that central structure, the beta barrel, also known as jelly roll, which is all of these beta strands here in the middle, is basically identical for all of these different structures. So probably in some dim, dark, distant ancestor of these viruses, it was just one virus that was a normal T equals 3 icosahedron. And then these proteins have diverged relative to each other. Yeah? So uh, for the single part, there's two copies of that as well, or is it just one single thing? Oh, so the VP4 protein? Yeah, it turns out that there are 60 copies of that as well. And we'll see where it fits. It's actually just on the inside of the structure. Uh, a little bit later on. And one of the other things that we'll see is that all of these proteins are made together as one protein. And so you're always going to have the same amount of each of them. So it makes sense that you've got 60 copies of that one as well um, in any given virion. So um, here, and again, T equals 3. How do you know how many capsid protein subunits you have? Take the T number, multiply it by 60. So you end up with 180 of these capsid proteins. So that's the virion structure itself. Getting back to your question, you know, where are the other proteins? That's here. And so if you look at just the <clears throat> five-fold axis of symmetry, where you have VP1, VP4 is on the inside. And so that's your you know, question about where VP4 is. So it's basically sitting on the inside relative to <clears throat> VP1. VP4 is really probably mostly important for getting the virus genome inside the cell. And so the big structural changes, we talked about fusion proteins quite a bit already, and we'll talk more about them as we talk about the different viruses as we move on through the rest of the class here. Uh, poliovirus and most of the picoRNA viruses, although they vary a little bit, um, is quite different because it injects its genome basically a lot like a bacteriophage at the plasma membrane. The way that happens is there's a conformational change. So again, the conformational change is really similar to what you would see with a fusion peptide. But these are naked virions. There's no envelope on the outside. So here, when you have interaction with the receptors, which are binding in these canyons next to the five-fold axis of symmetry, you have a conformational change where BP4, as you can see up here, basically relocates to underneath the VP1. Now, this is an oversimplification, of course. Uh, and you have the N terminus of VP1, which basically makes a hole in the membrane. And that N terminus is normally hidden in the middle of the virion. Again, once you have interaction with the receptor, it opens up this channel. And then VPG, which we'll talk about much more later, which is attached to the end of the genome, gets imported into the cell. And then that brings the rest of the genome in. Is that a stretch or a question? I think it was a stretch. That's fine. <laughs> so what are they binding to? Gee, appropriately named poliovirus receptor. Um, again, not important what each of these is, but what is important is the characteristics of all of these receptors for all of the different picoRNA viruses. Immunoglobulin superfamily, immunoglobulin superfamily, immunoglobulin superfamily, hopefully you get the message. So um, really these Ig domain proteins. Um, which are where you have the binding um, for all of these things. <clears throat> so once you have the binding, you have the conformational change, the genome comes in. Well, what is that genome? Here's the genome. Um, it's a single-stranded, positive-strand RNA, and it's unimolecular. So it's just one molecule that gets transported inside the cell. Relatively large. And what's really curious about it, when people first did the sequencing here, is that there's one and only one open reading frame in the whole genome, which is really kind of bizarre. It's like, yo, wait a minute. You know, is this one open reading frame? Um, and what it turns out is this is what's called a polyprotein. And so these are some of the longest open reading frames that are known, be it cellular or viral for that matter. And these code for multiple different proteins. 
that then get proteolytically cleaved, so the protein is made as one big protein, and then it gets chopped up into smaller pieces. And those individual pieces are what you need to make the whole <clears throat> protein. So let's just look at some of these in a little bit more detail. First, we've already talked about VP4, 2, 3, and 1. Um, this is just how they found them originally. The order here doesn't matter, but these are the capsid proteins. You also have lots of non-structural proteins, with the exception of one of these, the, the VPG protein. So that's the coding part. And we'll go through these individual proteins a little bit more a little bit later on. More importantly, at least as far as replication is concerned, is what's not in the protein coding region. Here at the three prime end of the poliovirus genome, not true for all the picovirus right, virus genome, but for the poliovirus genome, you have a whole stretch of adenine residues. And these are adenine residues that are coded for by the virus. If you think about normal polyadenylation that happens on eukaryotic messenger RNAs, this is all happening in the nucleus. It's a poly A polymerase. It's happening while you're transcribing. Well, this is just RNA, and it's replicating the cytoplasm. So it's got to have its own poly A tail, and that poly A tail is actually coded for by the virus genome. Here at the 5' prime end, there's a pretty big called non-coding region, also untranslated region. Sometimes people call it a UTR versus an NTR. And then at the very 5' prime end, there's a protein covalently bound to the end of the genome. And we'll see why this is really important um, a little bit later on. And this is also known as the, the VPG protein, which is coded for here um, right in the middle of the otherwise non-structural um, proteins. So <clears throat> again, this is replicating the cytoplasm. What do all viruses need? All viruses need cellular translation. So let's look a little bit at cellular translation, because I'm sure all of you remember it from when you have molecular biology. So <clears throat> cellular translation, how do you get protein from, this is, of course, eukaryotic messenger RNAs. Eukaryotic messenger RNAs have cap structures. They've got poly A tails way the heck over here. And first thing that happens is you have binding to that cap structure by one of the eukaryotic translational initiation factors. And that eukaryotic translational initiation factor is usually called EAF4F, which is a really bad name, but it's for a complex of multiple different proteins that are really basically involved in binding the cap structure and getting the ribosome to that five prime end of your messenger RNA. So most important, at least as far as we're concerned here, is the EAF4G protein, which is part of the EAF4F complex. It just forms a bridge between the cap and where you have the rest of your ribosome assembling. Once you get your ribosome close to the five prime end of your messenger RNA, everything's happy, then the small subunit of the ribosome scans along your messenger RNA until it gets to an AUG and starts. So that's your standard cellular translation initiation process. On the other hand, these viruses are doing things in a different way. You remember what's at the five prime end of these picoRNA viruses, particularly poliovirus genomes? It's a protein. There's no cap. So somehow you've got to get the ribosome to the beginning of that ginormous open reading frame. The way that happens is through the irises, or internal ribosome entry site. And an iris is basically a secondary structure which forms in the RNA, which is basically a site that says, hey, ribosome, this is a place you want to come and bind. And so it does. And the ribosome, particularly the small subunit of the ribosome, together with some of the initiation factors, will bind to this. Nearby is an AUG, and you're good to go. So why are the viruses doing this? Well, A, because they don't have a cap structure at one end of their messenger RNA. But B, and probably more importantly, particularly for polio and pretty much all of these other rhinoviruses, 
they want to shut down cellular translation. And the way they do that is by chewing up the EIF4G protein. The EIF4G is what's normally forming that bridge between the cap binding protein and all the ribosome. So if you don't have EIF4G, you're not going to get cellular translation, at least not cellular translation initiation. But if you have one of these iris sequences, now you can still get translation to happen, but it's only happening now on your viral genome as opposed to the cellular RNAs. Let's look at a couple of those irises. Turns out there are at least three different flavors or sequences thereof. Uh, this is the one from polio. We're going to talk more about this secondary structure when we talk about replication of the virus genome a little bit later on. It's not the 5 prime end but multiple different stem loop structures uh, important for how the iris works are really two main things. One of these is this very pyrimidine rich and pyrimidines are going to be your U's and C's. So lots of U's and C's. Uh, usually this is now no longer base paired and then has a start codon right next to it. So it's a secondary structure, stretch of U's and C's with an AUG quite next near to it. There are these other sequences as well, AC rich, GNRA sequences. They're not really that critical. Important, pyrimidine rich, relatively close to an AUG. So this is the structure that you have in polio and some of these other picoRNA viruses. There are other kinds of iris sequences. This is the so-called type 2. There's type 3. Important again is that we've got a pyrimidine rich sequence close to your AUG and then some other sequences as well. Turns out that these sequences are important for binding to those cellular translational initiation factors <coughs> excuse me, that are normally associated with the cap binding complex but now have to get associated to this iris sequence. So it's a structure that you have in your RNA, not just present in viruses, by the way. There are a number of cellular genes that also have these irises for getting translation to happen, particularly in the middle of a longer messenger RNA, uh, but clearly very important for these virus sequences that don't have caps at their 5' prime end. So secondary structure, pyrimidine rich, um, close to an AUG sequence, and then this polyprotein, which is right next to that. So let's revisit this polyprotein and take more of a look at it. So when the genome is released inside the cell, again, through these conformational changes, you have VPG, untranslated region, your whole messenger RNA, untranslated region, and a poly A tail. So <clears throat> that then gets translated, and the translation is one big protein and usually on the order of 1,000, in some cases as much as 2,000 amino acids in length. These are big proteins. Those then get chopped into smaller pieces, and that chopping process is almost always due to viral proteases. And so these are viral proteases that are encoded in this messenger RNA. And what that means is, They've got to be pretty darn flexible because they're made in one polypeptide chain. They have to be able to be functional in that polypeptide chain and usually chop themselves out of that polypeptide chain. First one here is the 2A protease. That's not as critical as the 3C protease. And, oh, by the way, the 1s, 2s, and 3s, um, those come from these original polyprotein segments that you get here. And, and for, again, the terminology here is, is horrible, but I didn't make it up. Um, so these are basically the one proteins, also known as the VP proteins. So we'll just call those VP. Everything that comes from this second segment are the two proteins, and this third segment are going to be the three proteins. And then in each of those segments, it's separated as A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D. So the 2A protease, which is here at the end terminus of the second polyprotein, makes the first set of cleavages, but again, the most important here is the 3C protease, 
And that's the one which does almost all of the cleavage of all of the rest of your proteins. So VP0, 3, and 1. 3 and 1 should sound familiar because that's what's put into the capsid structure. VP0 is actually between VP4 and VP2. This cleavage takes place really, really late, um, whereas all of the rest of these are happening really quite early. Curiously enough, the 3C protein is all the way down at the C terminus of this polyprotein. So it makes sense the first cleavage that's going to take place is going to be by a protease which is further up um, in, your, in your genome, because the translation is happening always from N to C terminus. Yeah? So is this showing that VP4 and VP2 is just, OK, so VP0 gets cut into VP4 and VP2? Is that what that's showing? Correct, yes. Um, but this happens very, very late in the process. Now, VP3 and VP1 are free proteins early on. And this happens, again, basically the very last step, the assembly process. So before you go through assembly, you, of course, have to make more of your genome. How do you do that? That's through this protein over here. You get a little crib sheet. It's the 3D PAL. PAL stand for polymerase. So this is the protein which is going to be doing the job of replicating your genome. Again, single-stranded RNA genomes. This is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It <clears throat> associates with the viral genome. But what happens here is all of this process takes place at internal membrane structures inside the cell. This is almost always a vesicle replication. If we look at Pretty much all of the RNA viruses we're going to talk about that are replicating the cytoplasm, they all replicate at these vesicles. Now, the reason for that seems to be that that process allows you to concentrate all of the viral proteins that you need to be undergoing these processes and probably allows you to get both ends of your genome to actually get together. So here, the cartoon up the top shows that you've got nicely stretched out linear genome. Well, that's not the case. And as we'll see, you actually have to be moving each of the individual pieces from one end of the genome to the other. So this is really much more of a membrane vesicle with a glob of genome around it, much more of a loop genome, which is, in fact, exactly what you see if you think about eukaryotic messenger RNAs. The cap and the tail are always associated with each other. So again, it's a very similar kind of process here. So <clears throat> the way this happens, you've got your VPG, this is your regular genome up at the top here. VPG has a tyrosine residue on it. We've talked about tyrosine residues already. Tyrosines are great because they've got an OH. That OH can basically pretend that it's a sugar residue, and so you can attach nucleotides to it. Uh, the VPG protein always has two uracils that are associated with it. So, that start of your genome, so the start of any of your picoRNA virus genomes is always going to be UU. That should be pretty obvious why that is. What's the three prime end? AA. So this is clearly going to be able to pa uh, base pair with the other end of the genome as well. So <clears throat> that's, in fact, exactly what happens. You have the 3AB protein which is, again, part of that polyprotein. The 3B protein is exactly the same as VPG, just you know, different naming um, for that. That gets cleaved at one of these membrane vesicles, has two U residues that have been added to that VPG protein. Then the three <coughs> 3D Paul protein will bind to the 3 prime N. That's what that... Um, 3D is uh, representing up there, the orange circle. That then will replicate its way along the genome. There are a couple of things that you need in order to get this process to take place. Almost all of those are at the 5' prime untranslated region. You remember there's a pretty big 5' prime untranslated region. It has the iris sequence in it, but it also has the secondary structures which bind to cellular proteins. So this PCBP2 is the poly-C binding protein. 
So it's a C residue binding protein in a secondary structure that forms at the 3' end. But there's also binding by the 3CD protein. You notice, you know, 3CD is part of that 3D protein. That whole process is really what's giving you the looped structure. And 3CD at this end of the genome will bind to VPG and give it a couple of U residues due to this Cree sequence, which is right in the middle there. So that Cree sequence also has a pair of A's that then the 3CD polymerase can bind to, bind to VPG, and put those two U's on the end. Then you have the movement of either VPG or the genome, such a way that you have the two U's paired, and then you replicate to the other end of the genome. Once you've replicated to the other end of the genome, you've got a negative strand, which is the orange strand right here, which of course is going to have a couple of A residues at the end because it's copied the two U's that you started with. Well, you've already got a bunch of VPG that you've been putting U residues on. Now this VPG can serve as a primer for your 3D polymerase to replicate its way through the rest of the genome. And it turns out that for a positive strand, you don't have all of this you know, moving around of the individual genomes. You've got lots of VPG. You can put U residues on it, so you end up with multiple copies of your positive strand being made from your negative strand. So you end up with many more copies of positive, because, of course, can then get packaged into your genome. Yeah? So there's a few shapes in here that look the same. Mm -hmm. um, on the second strand, yeah. that's the 3D protein. Right, so the 3D, also known as 3D Paul, so the polymerase protein, yes. Yes, exactly. So the 3D polymerase is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which will bind to, and particularly the VPG with the two U residues associated with it, and then extend that. So it can go both ways. It, it can, yeah, use any template. So it uses the you know, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the template is the either negative strand or positive strand RNA from the genome, and your primer is VPG with these two re U residues associated with it. So this should sound a little weird, hopefully, because RNA polymerases are great because what do they usually not need? Primers. And I keep saying this guy is using primers, right? So it turns out when people looked at the structure of the 3D polymerase, it's a DNA polymerase-like structure again makes sense because it's using all of these primers. And so the <clears throat> structure here, and I don't have all the other images, but this is really a splitting image of a DNA polymerase fold. Doesn't look like an RNA polymerase, doesn't look like the T7 RNA polymerase, doesn't look like the DNA dependent RNA polymerases. It really looks like a DNA polymerase. So it's basically a DNA polymerase that uses a RNA template and is making RNA. Um, but it still needs a template, it needs primers um, in order to be able to replicate. So this is in fact one of the reasons that people think that actually DNA polymerases evolved from these RNA dependent RNA polymerases. So viruses have invented DNA and that's a whole different story as well. Um, but the take home message here is that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in these, and it turns out almost all RNA viruses, are really much more like DNA polymerases than they are like RNA polymerases in terms of their structure, in terms of their function. So this is what's doing that part of the genome. So you've got, replicated your genome. Now you need to package it. And so that's where we get back to the question you had about VP0. So the process on how this gets put together you have your polyprotein, and particularly your P1 part of the protein, that again is VP0, VP3, and VP1. That gets chopped up into these three different pieces. Those three different pieces come together, and basically you form your triangular subunit. You need 20 of these to fit the whole structure together. 
these come together, you get a pentamer. This should sound really familiar from the Phi X174 story. These pentamers come together probably with the progeny RNA, so mostly this process here. So pentamers will form around that RNA. And then at the very end of this process, you finally get one more cleavage event that takes place. And that's between VP2 and VP4. So your VP0 goes to VP2 and VP4. And again, VP2 is on the outside. VP4 is then going to end up sitting on the inside. Um, the reason for this process, this final proteolysis, is, again, it's a really common process that you find in a lot of virus maturation that take place. And the reason for that is a proteolytic event is basically irreversible. Because you're not going to be, if you think about entropy, you're not going to be bringing those two pieces of peptide together, forming that peptide bond. You know, how do you form peptide bonds? Ribosomes. Are any ribosomes sitting inside one of these particles? No. Uh, so this cleavage event really gives you a unidirectional process. So you're only getting these assembled particles because all of this assembly otherwise, you know, panamers coming together, panamers coming apart, you have an equilibrium. And so when you have properly assembled particles, that then seems to lead to, and we don't actually understand completely how this works, um, the cleavage of VP0 into VP2 and VP4, and this guy is never going to go back to these individual pentamers that are present here. So now we have our virion. It can escape from the cell. It can go off and infect other things. And so <clears throat> that's you know, basically the process of these poliovirus replication. Yeah? So the, the question is, is this more stable than some of the other virus particles we've talked about? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, there hasn't been much work on you know, looking at the actual stability of many of these virions. The poliovirus virion is quite stable because it survives in wastewater and so on and so forth. So that's actually really quite stable um, virion. But how that is compared to some of the other ones, Again, it's got to survive in these, at least the virion, in such a way you can get transmission to take place. This is probably selection for it to be able to be stable in a lot of, of water solutions, basically you know, sort of wastewater kinds of conditions. Uh, all of the viruses we've talked about so far, at least we got to this one, are bacterial viruses. Those also have to be able to survive in usually liquid environments, so those are going to be pretty stable as well. So there's, but there are multiple ways to get stability. You know, there's this one, which is the proteolysis, but we also talked briefly when we talked about structure of the um, protein chain mail that happens in some of the bacterial viruses, where you have cross-links between in the individual subunits. So there are lots of ways to get stability. There's also coating them in silica, which I don't know if any of you saw the Portland State Magazine, there's stuff that my lab does, but that's a different story. Um, Okay, other questions about the, the virion and the, the assembly? I want to talk briefly about <clears throat> what happens in infected cells. Now, we already talked about the EIF4G protein. That is probably why the virus is using an iris sequence. But the three, <clears throat> excuse me, the three C protease also will cleave EIF4G. And so it's chopping up its own polyprotein, but it's also chopping up EIF4G, so you don't get cellular translation. And that's basically just shown down here. If you just look at protein synthesis in a non-infected cell, that sort of you know, goes up. If, however, it's now a poliovirus-infected cell, cellular translation goes way down, and that's basically because you haven't produced many viral genomes yet. As soon as you produce viral genomes, now you get a big peak of protein synthesis because that's all from the iris that you've got in your lots of new copies of your poliovirus genome. And then that goes down again because you're actually releasing um, virus. You can see that here if you just look at radio-labeled proteins, throwing S35, 
before infection, an hour after infection, three hours after infection, five hours after infection. You can see it's pretty much all virus proteins, but still a lot of this VP0 protein. And that's the one which is eventually going to get broken down into your <coughs> um, VP4 and, and VP2. But you see that's accumulating um, through this infection process. So, so 3C per, um, protease, which cleaves EIF4G, turns out it also cleaves some of the subunits of the cellular RNA polymerase. And then the last process that poliovirus, and again, a lot of these picoRNA viruses use, is a block to vesicle transport. And again, almost all of these blockages are due to proteolysis by the viral proteases of cellular proteins. Why do you want to be blocking vesicle transport? Well, the replication of the genome is dependent on having these vesicles inside the cell. So you want to block the normal transport of vesicles. Vesicles are usually for taking something on the inside of the cell, say the Golgi, out to the plasma membrane. Well, you block that, you end up with more and more vesicles, so you've got more and more places that you can be replicating your genome. So that's that, that's that process. So that's about it in terms of the molecular biology of these viruses. I wanted to talk a little bit more about disease. Generally, polio infections are no problem whatsoever. And this is, in fact, a, a big problem with vaccination and full polio eradication. You don't even know if somebody's infected with polio in many cases. Um, it's only relatively infrequently between 1 and 200 um, of people who you know to be infected with polio, and again, this is probably a drastic underestimation, have some paralytic effect, and anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of those um, die, but unfortunately, they're mostly kids, um, usually small children um, under age 5, um, and that's particularly those that are, end up dying. So the Sabin strain, we talked about attenuated viruses before. You know, these are the ones that still replicate, but don't cause disease. This was all done before we had any clue what the sequence was, what irises were, et cetera. Now we've gone back and looked at this vaccine strain. If you look at the history of vaccines, it's amazing that any of these things happen because, you know, certainly with IRB boards and human you know, consent, it was really pretty ugly. There's a nice chapter that we're not going to cover in this um, class, but if you're interested in, in vaccines, the chapter on vaccines at the end of the textbook is really quite good. I think it's chapter 36. Um, but... <clears throat> talks a little bit about this. And so these Sabin strains, it turns out, do not replicate in neurons, which is where you have all the problems with paralysis. And the reason, there's some changes in the iris sequence. Really pretty amazing. And you can now do this, and people have now done this, now that we actually can change the sequences. You can make exactly the same changes in this iris sequence, and then try and get the poliovirus to replicate in these neurons, and it won't. So that's uh, interesting, this, that, that selection, and they weren't growing them in neuronal cells when they're doing all these passages to make the attenuated virus. Now it turns out it probably re replicates really well in those cells, but it won't replicate in neurons anymore. And that seems to be the main reason that the Sabin virus is not causing this kind of paralytic disease, but is still replicating in the gut enough to give you um, nice immunity and also some, some herd immunity. Second thing I wanted to talk about, I mentioned that you know, poliovirus is really C332,652, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, and that you know, viruses are chemical units. Well, the poliovirus was made from scratch, basically based on the sequences that we knew. Um, a group, and this is Eckhard Wimmer's group, here it is, um, who <clears throat> took the sequence, the known sequence for poliovirus, and then using that sequence, we're able to make infectious particles, which is really a pretty amazing process. And there's a whole discussion about you know, biosecurity, et cetera, here. And a number of people have asked me, are you worried about this kind of thing? And you know, poliovirus, as I showed you right at the beginning, is almost eradicated now. It's, just, it's fabulous, but you can make it. <laughs> so, well, when I say you can make it, let's look at a few of the details here. So, the poliovirus being made in a self-free extract, this is, again, this is all work from Eckhard Wimmer's lab, who is one of the leading poliovirus researchers in the world. 
they first reported that just by taking that RNA, modifying it with the VPG at one end, making sure you've got the right sequence, and just RNA that they've purified from viruses, that no virus is around at all, they could actually make functional virus in a cell-free extract. That was published in 1991. And then it took them 11 years to buy the DNAs to make the RNA to make this protein in a completely synthetic fashion. And get these, and these are in fact the images from that paper, you know, false color EM. But these are the virions which they made in that process. So this whole process was literally going online, ordering DNAs, doing in vitro transcription, usually with the T7 RNA polymerase, uh, and then that would be able to use that RNA to make polio with. So there are a couple things that happened after this particular study. The first one is that all of the DNA manufacturers put in software to say, hey, um, if you're making one of these things that matches any known virus sequence, start, you know, big bells and whistles and red light, flashing lights, et cetera. So that's one thing that happened since then. Um, ex-graduate student of mine is working at one of the big oligo um, DNA synthesizing companies. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is that this, again, was a, you know, probably the leading lab in working on polio. It took them over 10 years to go from one step to the next step. And even then, turns out that this particular virus is really pretty wimpy. Um, and they made it wimpy in, in some cases as well. Uh, but I think that this process, it takes 10 years to do. Now all of the manufacturers are in such a place that it's you know, very difficult to order any of these things. Sure, you could make them yourselves. It's hard to do that, but it's doable. Um, the other thing is that we've got really good vaccines against this disease. Most people are much more concerned about things like Smallpox. Well, can you do the same thing with smallpox? Well, genome of polio is about 6,000 nucleotides. Genome of smallpox is hundreds of thousands of nucleotides. So that process is much harder. And these guys replicate in the cytoplasm. It's really easy to get a cell-free extract to make these things. On the other hand, some of these nastier viruses are completely dependent on the nucleus, and so we really don't have a good handle on how they're actually replicating. So just to finish up, I um, wanted to mention what I'm probably infected with. Uh, 99 different serotypes have been sequenced relatively recently. All of them have these iris sequences at their 3' prime end. All of them have a 5' prime structure that's really similar to what you find in the poliovirus genome, so a poly C binding site, a 3D polymerase binding site, where you're probably starting the process of genome replication. Curiously, though, they don't have poly A tails. They almost all have these three prime hairpin structures which form. So it's probably protecting that end of the genome, but how they replicate then is a much more open question. So how that's actually, I mean, this is, um, this is the reference to um, <clears throat> that uh, paper right here. Um, it's basically what I've talked about. They're all over the place, um, relatively old, at least as far as human disease is concerned. They're certainly still here, although we're trying to get rid of them. Pseudo T equals three particles, internal ribosome entry sites, proteases, critical for cleaving up this polyprotein. The VPG protein is your primer. The 3D polymerase goes from there, and these are all you know, put together as individual subunits. Again, the three proteins, BP0, BP1, and BP3, then gets cleaved finally. Hosts are unhappy because you cleave up the translational initiation proteins. They also blocking vesicle transport. And we talked a little bit about disease. These are some key concepts, and I did want to, in just the last couple of minutes, show you a a video which the Gates Foundation put together. Um, this is just three minutes, and it's not you know, critical for this course, but it's just really nicely done as far as I'm concerned. So let's see if we can get it to play. That's another question. Would you have to put that in the 
no. Let me plug this in. Hang on. Patients are so enabled by the skills that they have. So what am I doing? I'm only enabling them to reach their highest optimal levels that life can get them to. Nothing more. These smiles and the thank yous and the joys of patients that I care for, that's enough to sustain them for a lifetime. No one ever thought that they could reach this level at least in polio. But the fact that we can put this disease in history books is one of the greatest achievements of mankind. You are ridding the world of a major disabling illness and therefore the same money can be used for other challenges in this world. The burden of disability in the world is reduced to that huge extent. <laughs> दिया होता नहीं, वो किसी को नहीं देखना पड़े, नहीं उठाना पड़े, ये तो बहुत अच्छी बात है, वो किसी को नहीं हुआ है, और हुआ ही नहीं तो अच्छी बात है। My dream would be, maybe not in my lifetime, but somewhere down the line, this world should be empty, a dream realized. That's all. Nothing more.